he gives the instructions now uh, to everybody on uh, mindfulness of breathing. So we can tell that it's already like a, it's, it has a tinge of like, it's an advanced kind of, you know, these, these are all monks that have been practicing, but it's also a really beautiful insight on like the core of his teaching also. So here it is and how, how this is, uh, I like to call it the toolbox, the toolbox of the Dhamma, the toolbox of meditation. And there's many things that we can take in there and use at a, at a specific time. And how, how this ties in, how the, this sequence that he's talking about fulfills the, the four satipatthanas, the four resting places of awareness, which are basically what the Buddha called wise awareness in the Eightfold Path, right mindfulness. And these, in return, fulfill the seven supports of awakening that we talked briefly about yesterday. And the sutta is very special because it is the most, the, the most clear explanation of all of these things. The satipatthanas, the seven supports of awakening, um, how they work, how they arise, and how to work with them, and it's so clear. And a lot of the times we only hear the sequence of Anapana, but it seems like people don't even go further in the sutta where it explains like pretty much everything <laughs> you need to know about uplifting the mind into collectedness, into samadhi. So, without further ado, how is meditation using the breath as a reminder cultivated for it to be highly fruitful and beneficial? So I translate anapana sati as uh, the, using the breath as a reminder because sati doesn't just mean mindfulness. Actually, the literal meaning of sati means to remember. And this is maybe a trivial difference, but uh, when you say mindfulness of breathing, it tends to like put the focus on the breath, whereas breath is not really the focus here. Focus here is on developing wholesome mental states with each and every breath. So that's a big, big difference. Okay. So here, monks, someone resorts to the forest at the root of a tree in an empty cabin at Buddhapada in Kalimpong. Sitting down with legs folded and body upright or on a chair, uh, sitting on a pillar. Having reposed one's awareness about oneself, Breathing in with presence, breathing out with presence. And I thought, you know, I'm from Canada, so I thought maybe we could play a little game tonight and uh, play a little Finding Waldo. So maybe uh, we'll try to find where are the six R's in the sequence. Uh, that. That's Canadian. Yeah, it's very Canadian. Wow. Thank you, Canada. <laughs> isn't, <laughs> isn't Finding Waldo Canadian? I thought it was. I think it was. Yeah, I don't know. I, that makes sense. He's got the red and white hat. Oh, uh, yeah. I mean, I, and I'm from the French side, so it's completely different. It's a Trouvé Charlie. It's like not even the same name. But uh, yeah, I think it's from Canada. That's what I've been told, anyways. I look a bit like Waldo. Red guy. Those books were frustrating sometimes. I, I think. <laughs> Certain pages, they just wouldn't put Waldo and just leave you guessing for <laughs> Canadian humor. <laughs> One is aware of a long breath as a long breath, breathing in and out. One is aware of a short breath as a short breath, breathing in and out. So, right here, we have a little quiz. <laughs> so it's easy, don't worry. Did I say the word focus? Okay, no. Did I say the word nostril? No, okay. Did I say the word abdomen? No, okay. Good, good. 
in Pali, this would be like the nostrils is nasika, and um, uh, focus. I'm not sure what that would be, but um, so yeah. It's uh, do you have any idea why I didn't say these words? Because it's, yeah, because it's not there. <laughs> Great answer. <laughs> you all passed the quiz. Great, <laughs> awesome. Because that's where you would start focusing, right? If you've ever heard the Anapana uh, instructions, you know that's that's right there. You, know, you start focusing on your nostrils or something like that. But it's not there, and that's you know I was saying uh, yesterday how I was I had all these questions and I asked Sayadaws and you know top abbots of monasteries of various traditions and um, that was one of the questions. I was like, where, where does it say, like, focus, and where does it say uh, nostrils, and all this, and I couldn't find it in the suttas, and they were just like, oh, yeah, this is, this is commentary, you know, you have to know the commentaries and all that. So I was like, okay, maybe I'm just, yeah, I don't know anything about anything. One trains, now, um, one difference here is that the word that we're using is one is aware, and this in Pali is uh, pajanati. Pajanati is just to know. So there, there's not really an action here, it's just to know. It's just basically like, uh, like I know there's a table here, you know, that's, that, that's it. So you know, this ties into the Buddha's teaching about understanding things and reality as it truly is. Yata bhutang jnana dasanang. So when you're breathing, whatever length of the breath you're breathing doesn't matter. You just know it for what it is. That's all that the first two lines here mean. One trains to experience the whole body, breathing in and breathing out. One trains to calm the tension in the body, breathing in and breathing out. Okay, so here is when the first word that is kind of an action word, an action verb, which is sikkati, but one trains. So this is where the training actually starts. And now we are aware of the whole body, body uh, sabbakayang, um, patisangwedi, basically, that's the Pali. Uh, but because of the commentarial interpretation of this, uh, in a lot of translations, you'll have brackets right beside the whole body, and it's going to be written of breath. Because in the commentaries, you're supposed to focus on the breath. Uh, but that's not here. The, the brackets are not here. And that originates from... Um, Basically, there's a sutta where the, the Buddha says there's three kinds of sankharas and the bodily sankharas, the kaya sankharas, this is in, in and out breathing. And so the Pali scholars decided, well, he's saying kaya sankara here, so that means like it's the in and out breathing, basically, that there's no other way. But um, this is really if you want to... Uh, narrow down the focus of attention onto a really specific topic. Uh, kaya sankaras can be a lot of things and they can be anything that is happening with your body. Breathing is one of them, but it's not the all in all of the, what that means. And so just to come, come back to our little game here of finding Waldo, so what would that be here? these two first steps that are actually active. Which one to train to calm the tension in the body. Relax, the relaxed step. Very good. So starting strong with the relaxed step, the most important step in the whole process. Are you sleeping? <laughs> <laughs> I like, it can't be that boring. <laughs> like, uh. <laughs> what? Was my yeah, I was calming, <laughs> calming the sankharas. Yeah, great. 
um, and I just, um, I just thought I would, uh, just for the record, because I just like to uh, put a quote from Bhante in there, from his book. Where am I? Okay. So this is from Bhante's book, actually, uh, Life is Meditation, Meditation is Life, his most, uh, not his most recent, but uh, relatively recent. So basically what happened is that he wrote his first book, the Anapanasati Sutta, which he wrote the commentaries to that. In, and then the Breath of Love, which was basically the Anapanasati, but expanded with the metta and, uh, and the, the beginning of introducing the Brahma Viharas with this sequence. And then life is meditation, meditation is life, is like the kind of the more exp expounded uh, teaching, basically, that he's kind of like come, come upon and made up, basically, around, around this, uh, this topic. And this is what he's saying around this very uh, specific uh, topic. Just let the breath be. And relaxing awareness is a natural process. The simple, so basically, uh, one trains thus, uh, breathing in, calming the, uh, the tension in the body, the formations in the body, and uh, breathing in and out, uh, knowing the whole body and tranquilizing the whole body. This simple statement is the most important part of the meditation instructions. It is also the most neglected part of the instructions for the breathing meditation. Strange to tell. <laughs> I just like to find Bhante's humor in there too. <laughs> it, is it is a remarkable omission that is actually the key difference between the Buddha's meditation instructions and the absorption one-pointed concentrations that basically came later and crept back into his teaching. This part of the instructions directs the meditator to notice the tension and tightness which arises in the head with every arising of a consciousness. So every arising of a distraction, of a thought, there is this cramping down. And this is why when I was practicing other pra uh, meditation practices which did not have the relaxed step, you, go, you come back to an object, perhaps, yes, but you never let go. So there's never that letting go process happening. So you're just accumulating tension, accumulating tension all the time. And to let go of that tightness. So this is what Bhante says about this. I think, you know, the finger exercise, you did that the other day. It'd be cool if everyone could yeah. try that for a second yeah. to really experience this. So if you just, if you wouldn't mind putting a finger in front of you and then focus really hard on the tip of your finger with all your effort. Like try to block everything else out. And notice how if you do that with all your effort, really trying to let nothing, nothing else into your mind but the tip of your finger. How there's a lot of effort and actual craving in that. You might feel a slight tension. And now, if, and now if you just allow your gaze to be very wide and open to the whole room, do you feel that, that relax, that tension just kind of go, ah. And that's like the, the natural mind. That's like seeing things as it is, as opposed to trying to control the mind. So now imagine doing this for 50,000 hours. <laughs> How much did you... <laughs> Okay, so I hope you're ready because the next one will come with a quiz as well. <laughs> one trains to experience joy, breathing in and breathing out. One trains to experience happiness, breathing in and breathing out. So which R would that be? Ah, re-smiling, yes, yeah. 
So I have a little question for you. Well, that was the first question of the, the very good answer and very well. The second question is, how can you bring up joy without smiling? Can you try? Like, try to bring up joy without smiling. Ah, yeah, that's, that's about right. <laughs> yeah, like... You know, a lot of people really fight hard with us sometimes to say like, you know, the Buddha never taught smiling. Well, I mean, how do you bring up joy, you know, like, how do you bring up happiness, piti, sukkha, and um, I don't know, the only thing I can answer with like, you know, a contemporary vocabulary is like just smile, basically, and it's proven by science as well, so. Yeah, there's also, is it Sutta 87, Madhuma Nikaya? where uh, one of the kings comes to visit the Sangha, the monks that are practicing, and says, basically, now paraphrasing, wow, the progress here must be really good because all these monks are smiling and laughing and uh, their minds are like aloof like wild deer. And that's his observation of seeing the Sangha, these very happy monks, essentially. And he does use the word smile and laugh, I believe. Yes, yes. Uh, and and even, even if it was not exactly these words, uh, that sequence is quite explicit, uh, no matter what. So, mm -hmm. uh, and the, the Buddha talked about joy and happiness, piti sukha, like so much. It comes back over and over again. Uh, it's one of the seven supports of awakening. It's the, in the first and the second and the third jhana. I mean, like how much more proof do we need? And, um, and it's in the Dhamma Chaitya Sutta. Uh, I mean, I, I have a whole, I also controlled F the whole canon about this. So yes, it's in there a lot. <laughs> And then there's, he talks about mudita all the time, yeah. And so here, uh, another interesting point is um, piti sukha. And I, I just basically gave the answer, but where, where do we find that in, in the other parts of, of his instructions and teaching? We just saw it yesterday. Sorry? In, in the jhanas, basically. Viveka jang piti sukkang. So the first level of meditation is uh, characterized by the joy and happiness that comes from letting go. The second, the second jhana is uh, samadhi jang piti sukkang uh, the joy and the happiness that come from collectedness of mind because when that joy and happiness arise and we let go which is obviously at the very beginning of all meditation instructions here uh, calming down the tension relaxing, releasing uh, the mind just becomes collected with the joy also so, as we've been reading every morning. And so this is basically saying how to enter the, the, the first jhana, but, and it's quite, quite obvious, like, I mean, I don't know how more obvious it could be, but the thing is that now this is being interpreted as, as you put your attention on your nostril tips, which, who knows where that comes from, <laughs> it's not in there, that's for sure, um, <laughs> then at some point after, probably if you're a monk and doing that like five, six, seven hours every day, after maybe three, four months, <laughs> you're going to have like some PT arising. And that's like translated as like rapture or whatever it is. Like it's really strong, you know, uh, like feeling of 
Um, that's usually what you're looking for basically in absorption concentration practices is that, that really strong uh, rapture basically or joy but that is not not necessarily a, a natural joy it's a joy that really comes in after like really owning into like a very small pinpoint object and it takes a long time for it to arise whereas here it's the opposite he says do that and then the mind becomes collected so it's the opposite, it's the other way around. It's not you're trying to concentrate the mind and then these things arise, it's that you make these things arise and then mind gets collected. So then one trains to experience the movements of the mind, breathing in and breathing out. One trains to calm the movements of the mind, breathing in and breathing out. And again, this is the quiz, Waldo. <laughs> so which of the R's would that be? Experiencing the movements of the mind. Yeah, very good. Yeah. So, yeah, of course it's not, it's not exactly the same order here, but it's the same principles. Okay, so it, it works in the same way. Uh, and uh, the six R's are... Uh, using these exact same principles, basically. It's just uh, explained a little bit differently. And one trains to calm the mental movements, the movements of the mind. Which, which Waldo would that be? Yeah, yeah. That's, that's where I take the release to be mental. Also that, um, also that Bhante would clearly say, well, every time he explains the release part, he says, basically, it's about not keeping your attention on it, uh, not feeding it with your attention. Anyways, from what I understood. So that's why I always say release is mental and relaxing is physical. So, and this is where I also uh, take this from. One trains to experience the mind, breathing in and breathing out. One trains to uplift the mind with joy, huh. breathing in and breathing out. So, I mean, this is obviously another, comes back another time, the smiling, but uh, yeah, I, ju I just like that it comes up three times in there. Uh, Piti, Sukha, and Abhipamodaham, basically, that's that word, like uplifting the mind with, with joy. One trains to gather the mind, Samadaham, breathing in and breathing out. So now we're touching upon mostly like the result, and obviously calming the tension, feeling the mental movements, letting go of those mental movements, bringing up joy, bringing up happiness, smiling. The mind will just collect and basically at this point is just stepping out of the way and letting that happen basically. It's not really something that you're forcing uh, and it's really well explained later also. Um, one trains to untangle the mind or uh, liberate the mind, Vimo Chayang. And this is where uh, these three first uh, sections is where we find most of the meditation instructions, basically. The four following ones are more uh, closer to like the more, more advanced practice, I would say. And this is why this kind of the mindfulness of breathing is usually understood as more like a, a bit more advanced is because of maybe these four last uh, steps which touch upon anicca sanya, like the perception of impermanence. As the mind gets collected and still then uh, everything else, like the, all the movements outside and physicality will all appear like as they are like arising and passing away because the mind is very still it's not latching on to any part of it so when the mind is still um, it's seeing the river going by but it's hard to see the river going by if you're in a car driving 100 miles per hour 
So it's, uh, it's the same principle. One trains to see constant change, breathing in and out. One trains to see calming down, breathing in and out. One trains to see the end of awareness, breathing in and out. This is Niroda. One trains to see breaking free, Patinisaga, breathing in and out. One of the other things that um, happens with the sutta is that in the Pali text, the Pali has been um, arranged in such a way that this was translated, uh, this was transmitted orally over a long period of time until it was put down on paper. And the way that it's organized is for oral recitation, basically. So that's why there's so much repetition in it. And it can get really tedious to, to read the suttas sometimes. Like, uh, really, a lot of people, that's what deters them from reading the suttas because it's just so un, uh, like illiteral or like uh, dry, yes. <laughs> I was trying to be a little bit more, you know. Fancy. <laughs> Just pretty stale. <laughs> pretty stale reading. And it's true. Uh, and that's what it is. Uh, some repetition is uh, wanted and is useful sometimes. Uh, that's true. And that's probably like a rhetorical um, methodology of the Buddha. Sometimes he was probably repeating things so that it was, you know, uh, it, it got into their, the people's mind, basically. But there's definitely more repetition than needed. Uh, and that's just because the, the monks would remember them uh, like that. And in this particular translation, usually this reads like, one trains to see the end of awareness while breathing in. One trains to see the end of awareness while breathing out. One trains to see breaking free while breathing in. One trains to see breaking free while breathing out. And basically what that does is that this puts a lot of emphasis on breathing again, which um, I think it's just because of the way that it's uh, been preserved in this very highly repetitious way. <laughs> Uh, it also feeds that misunderstanding that there should be attention on the breath where uh, really it's not really part of the meditation. So when we give instructions on forgiveness meditation, for example, just so you can understand, we, uh, we will say, okay, so you want to do this every step. You say, I forgive you. Please forgive me. I forgive you. Please forgive me. The point of this meditation is not to focus on your steps. <laughs> this is just a time marker. This is just to tell you, you do that every step. And that's just the way that you're going to do this meditation all the time. It's the same thing with the breath. The breath's got nothing to do with it. It's just, you do this constantly, bringing up these seven supports of awakening, which are clearly expressed here, while breathing in and out. And that's it. Because breathing in and out, you're going to be breathing in and out anyways. <laughs> it's already happening. You don't have to force it. You don't have to do anything about it. This is yatabu tang yana dasanang, seeing things for what they are. And so, Seeing this in that way, it brings, it, it brings a whole different understanding. And we can see the seven supports of awakening. This is just about cultivating each of them, one after the other. When one arises, if, um, if someone brings up joy, for example, and then breathing in and out, smiling, joy, <laughs> enjoying, and then Tension arises. Well, then you can just relax the tension in the body and then continue with the joy as well. So this is obviously a, a sequence, but it's also a toolkit. So whenever something arises, you just pull out the tool. You, you just like put the right tool on the problem and then that's it. You fix it and then that's how it keeps going. 
So this is not so much of a sequence that has to happen exactly like this, but it also is a toolkit that you can use anytime. Are we, uh, are we covered with the six R's and Waldo? Yeah, I mean, Recognize it's repeat and return, but those are kind of implied. Yeah. Oh, you, you mentioned, yeah, repeat is just like doing this constantly. Yeah, but that's coming as well, so, yeah. Uh, yeah, release, relax, relax. There's not the returning to the metta, but uh, yeah, the, the other, um, the alternative uh, reading that I like is uh, like um, one trains to see breaking free, radiating, radiating metta within and radiating metta without, inside and outside. That can also be. Uh, so basically all over the place, just beaming your metta. This is how to cultivate awareness using the breath as a reminder for it to be highly fruitful and beneficial. How is meditation using the breath as a reminder cultivated and developed so that it fulfills the four resting places of awareness? the four satipatthanas, the foundations of mindfulness. Now, body as body. At, at the time when one is aware of a long breath as a long breath, of a short breath as a short breath, when one trains to experience the whole body and trains to calm the tension in the body while breathing in and out, at that time, one is resting one's awareness upon body, knowing it as only body, intent, fully conscious and present, letting go of tension and distractions. So um, this is a bit my rendering of, of, the, of the classic um, sequence of the Satipatthanas. But this is basically just uh, pertaining to the body, awareness of the body. So um, the Buddha says, I say, this is, this is just another bodily experience bound up with the body, that is, breathing in and breathing out. So I, I like, you know, in nowadays there is such a huge emphasis on the Satipatthana Sutta, uh, some of you might be familiar with that or might not. Uh, I'm not going to go into great details about this, but um, it feels, uh, that if you just take the Satipatthana Sutta by itself, this is a, it, it's a very advanced uh, teaching where you need to have a little bit of background before you dive into this. And um, the four Satipatthanas, basically, they are they constitute what the Buddha said was wise awareness. But they're not necessarily a meditation instruction per se. They're more like a, a way to understand reality as it is. That's what that means, basically. The four satipatthanas are dependent origination without the craving bit and above. So basically, uh, that's what Whenever you hear the four foundations of mindfulness, um, it's just talking about dependent origination, but here and now without the craving link and the clinging and the identity, because it's seeing things for what they actually are. And if you just read the Satipatthana Sutta, it, it feels really dry, like it feels like you just have to be like equanimous all the time with everything that's arising and you can't do anything about it, it's just the way it is and that's it. But it's not true, like here the Buddha clearly says calming the bodily tension and knowing the whole body. This is knowing body as body and when you read the sequence uh, one is resting one's awareness upon the body, knowing it as only body, intent fully conscious and present letting go of tension and distractions. Um, when you just read that sequence, it feels like you, you just know body as body, you're not meant to do anything, but it's not true. 
relaxing the tension is part of the satipatthana. It's part of awareness of body. So it has an active component to it. So when I started understanding it in that way, I started understanding, um, well, a lot of my questions were starting to become answered by uh, well, you know, there's Satipatthanas is great, but how do you get there? Like, how does it work? And the Buddha clearly says here, and that's why I prefer the Anapanasati Sutta uh, to explain the Satipatthanas rather than the Satipatthana Sutta. <laughs> Anyways, okay, that's enough geekiness. <laughs> I'll move on to the, to the next at the, at the time when one trains to experience joy, one trains to experience happiness, one trains to experience the movements of the mind, one trains to calm the movements of the mind, breathing in and out. One is resting one's awareness upon sensations, knowing them as only sensations, intent, fully conscious and present, letting go of tension and distractions. I say this is just another kind of sensation bound up with all that is felt, that is wise attention, breathing in and breathing out. So see here, the Buddha is not that strict about you know, all these concepts and ideas. He's explaining mindfulness of breathing. Basically, these are the seven supports of awakening, and he's tying them back into the four satipatthanas, it's a living ecosystem. It's not like a closed loop where uh, you can only do one thing and that's, that's just the way it is. And then now he's going to explain after this how the four satipatthanas also feed the seven supports of awakening. So it's a very living process. It's not uh, fixed and it's not poured in concrete uh, as personally I used to thought, think. At the time when one trains to experience the mind breathing in and out, one trains to uplift the mind with joy, one trains to gather the mind, and one trains to untangle the mind, breathing in and breathing out. At that time, one is resting one's awareness upon mind, simply knowing it as mind, intent, fully conscious and present, letting go of tension and distractions. I say there is no awareness with the breath for one who forgets to be present and fully conscious. Being aware of mind for the Buddha was a lot about being present and fully conscious, not pinpointing down, but actually being fully aware. When we start to understand the suttas in that way, everything starts to make a lot of sense. Sati Sampajanya. Why, why does he say Sampajanya if we're going to like concentrate on a pinpoint, you know? Why, why is it like full awareness? Uh, how could absorption be full awareness? At the time when one trains to see constant change, one trains to see calming down, to see the end of awareness, to see breaking free. Breathing in and breathing out. At that time, one is resting one's awareness upon mental states. Dhamma or uh, Dhamma principles. Knowing them as only principles of the mind. Intent, fully conscious and present. Letting go of tension and distractions. Vinaya lokaya bija domanasang. Seeing with discernment Tension and distractions are abandoned, and one wisely attends with steadiness. Developed and cultivated in this way, monks, meditation using the breath as a reminder fulfills the four resting places of awareness. So as we learn to uh, understand the mind, understand uh, all these principles, basically, we're not, uh, we're not clinging to any of it, and then the mind becomes very steady. And so this is the last step here that happens. How are the four resting places of awareness cultivated and developed so that they fulfill the seven supports of awakening? 
And so see here how mindfulness of breathing is pretty much talking about the seven supports of awakening from the beginning, but now it's talking about it again. <laughs> But here in a more uh, elaborated sequence and um, this sequence particularly answers a lot of questions about how the seven supports of awakening, the Bojangas work together and how they kind of uh, evolve in, in the linear process as well. When one meditates resting one's awareness on the body knowing it as only body, intent, fully conscious and present, letting go of tension and distractions. One is not carried away by distractions, okay, because we're letting go of everything, we're resting it here in the body. It's just awareness of the body is always there, you don't need to do anything about it. It's actually growing clearer when you stop doing everything else and just rest in it. When one is not carried away and there comes to be awareness at that time, the support of awakening of awareness becomes manifest. Is there the support of awakening of awareness? <laughs> Present. <laughs> Present in the room? Okay, good. People are back. <laughs> It is being developed and it gradually matures by development. Meditating with this awareness. Now, next step. One seeks wholesome states and discards unwholesome ones and completely understands one's mental states that arise using discernment. Whenever one is meditating with awareness, seeking wholesome states, discarding unwholesome ones. At that time, the support of awakening of discernment or investigation of states, basically, this is the right effort to be, uh, to be more clear. The support of awakening of discernment becomes manifest. It is being developed and it gradually matures by development. Whenever there is seeking wholesome states and discarding unwholesome ones and completely understanding mental states as they arise with discernment, continually, enthusiastically, and enthusiastically I take from Bhante's own version actually, enthusiasm of, of virya basically. I also call that determination in a determined way, with devotion. At that time, the support of awakening of determination or virya or energy becomes manifest. And that's another part that gets misinterpreted a lot, the word energy uh, or effort. And this is wise effort, wise energy. So it's not like going all in and like, really trying hard. That's not the energy we're talking about here. Energy, and that's, you just have to know the suttas, but at some point the Buddha breaks it down and he explains what he means by virya, and he says uh, energy is basically right effort, basically. It's right effort done continuously. That's what he means by virya, so determination. It becomes manifest, it is being developed, and it gradually matures by development. With this inspired practice or devoted practice, continual practice, spiritual joy arises. Whenever spiritual joy arises because of inspired practice, at that time the support of awakening of joy becomes manifest. It is being developed and it gradually matures by development. And here, uh, it's one of the only places in the suttas, like this, this sutta explains a lot of things. And here the word spiritual joy is actually niramisa, which is like a non-material, uh, non-carnal, like um, 
uh, joy, basically. And that's where the Buddha makes that clear, that this is the joy of mental development, of bhavana, of the higher mind, adhi chitta, which has nothing to do with the senses, but that comes up from within, basically, with your smile. With this spiritual joy, the body calms down, and the mind calms down. Whenever the body calms down and the mind calms down because of that spiritual joy, at that time the support of awakening of calm becomes manifest. It is being developed and it gradually matures by development. With this calmness of body, the, mind, the happy mind becomes good. Ha. Two people are following, three people are following. <laughs> <laughs> Very good. This is like uh, why we practice this every morning so that we can you pass the test here. At that time, the support of awakening of mental collectedness becomes manifest. It is being developed. Yeah, that was a tough one. Sorry. <laughs> And it gradually matures by development. With this calm, collected mind, one steadily attends with discernment. Whenever one steadily attends with discernment by way of calm, collectedness of mind, at that time the support of awakening of mental steadiness becomes manifest. It is being developed and it gradually matures by development. So here, one after the other, we have a breakdown, a very clear explanation of how the seven supports of awakening work. And even with the Satipatthana, how the Satipatthanas work, and how they're supposed to bring up these seven supports of awakening within us, which have joy in them. And whoever is telling you to be afraid of the joy, they're double wrong. <laughs> because first they're telling you to be afraid, which is a hindrance, <laughs> and they're telling you to be afraid of the joy which is to be developed. And so it's a double misinformation. <laughs> I'm just putting it out there. <laughs> I've been told this for five years. <laughs> so I was pretty happy when I figured that out. <laughs> I didn't need to be afraid of the joy. Actually, I needed to develop it, which is what I was reading in the suttas in the first place. When you read the suttas, the word joy, the word piti, the word sukha, ease, happiness, abhi, pamoda, hang, uplifting the mind with joy, um, come back over and over and over again. And it's really clear, actually, when we start understanding this properly. Now I'll do a little exercise. Of course, there's the four satipatthanas. We've only done one. And don't worry, I'm going to spare you. And I'm not going to go do the three others because it's the same sequence. And it's just basically saying with sensation as sensation, with mind as mind, with Dhamma principles and as Dhamma principles. And with each of them, basically, if we do those properly, the seven supports of awakening arise with the joy, with continuous effort, and then it all calms down, it becomes collected and steady. And this feeds into awareness. Um, but one thing I like to, to do is to say that this also works with loving kindness, with the Brahma Viharas. When you have loving kindness with your, for your spiritual friend or in all directions all at once, uh, like a lot of people have been experiencing today. I've given a lot of uh, breaking down the barriers instructions and uh, all directions instructions today. And when one does this, sending loving kindness to all directions, to all living beings, one is not carried away by distractions. And there comes to be awareness. When one is not carried away and there comes to be awareness, at that time the support of awakening of awareness comes, becomes manifest. It is being developed and it gradually matures by development. And I'm just going to stop there because you know the rest. 
<laughs> so I just wanted to put it in there that it's not just with this, the satipatthanas. This whole practice, this is an ecosystem, this is like a permaculture ecosystem. It's when it's done properly, it's all sustaining each other, it's helping each other, it's growing each other. All, every plant is there to help all the other plants as well. And this is how this beautiful path arises with joy and happiness. Basically, this is the core of the Anapanasati Sutta. Uh, if we really kind of go to the, the essential of it, there's a few things around it, but um, I prefer to uh, leave you with this and uh, just basically keeping the seed uh, of the, the most important uh, aspects of, of this discourse. And so I think uh, now we, we've played the little Waldo game. We found the six R's in the Anapanasati. Um, we told Bhante Vimaramsi's awakening story. The oh wow awakening. And um, we saw how the Satipatthanas are not a dry practice. They are a very alive nourishing practice that has joy in it and that has room for mental development which has the component of being active there there are verbs in there <laughs> it's not just nouns <laughs> so there's things to be done and that's good because then it makes sense and it's not nihilistic <laughs> and it uplifts the mind into liberation which is beautiful in the beginning, beautiful in the middle, and beautiful in its ending. So, on this, I have a poem for you uh, that I will leave you with, and maybe we can have a little Q and A's after that, or whatever is needed. So this is a poem from Naomi Shihab Nai, and this is called So Much Happiness, and it's from 1952. It is difficult to know what to do with so much happiness. Some of you have been experiencing that lately. With sadness, there is something to rub against. A wound to tend with lotion and cloth. When the world falls in around you, you have pieces to pick up. Something to hold in your hands, like ticket stubs or change. But happiness floats. It doesn't need you to hold it down. It doesn't need anything. Happiness lands on the roof of the next house, singing and disappears when it wants to. You are happy either way. Even the fact that you once lived in a peaceful treehouse and now live over a quarry of noise and dust cannot make you unhappy. Everything has a life of its own. It too could wake up filled with possibilities of coffee cake and re ripe peaches and love even the floor which needs to be swept, the soiled linens and the scratched records. Since there is no place large enough to contain so much happiness, you shrug. You raise your hands and it flows out of you, into everything you touch. You are not responsible, you take no credit, as the night sky takes no credit for the moon, but continues to hold it and share it, and in that way be known. So on this. <laughs> okay, so let's share our merits. Thank you. Yeah, I hope I didn't.
shouldn't uh, over over speak. No, no, yeah. no. I I like to have this. Uh, it's nice. Oops. Rejoicing in the merits two thirteen. May suffering ones be suffering free, and the fear struck fearless be. May the grieving shed all grief, and may all beings find relief. May all beings share these merits that we have thus acquired for the acquisition of all kinds of happiness. May beings inhabiting space and earth, devas and nagas of mighty powers, share these merits of ours. May they long protect the Buddha's dispensation. Sad, sad, sad. Okay, on this, have a beautiful evening, night. Keep smiling. And I'll see you tomorrow.